about the differences and similarities between kit versus custom, when to use which, um, some design principles and processes you should go through whenever you're deciding whether to use COTS parts or custom parts. We'll go over a little bit of CAD software basics in terms of which ones are out there and what they're used for. Uh, we're going to dive into machinery and fabrication techniques as well as material choice. And then we're going to look at two case studies, one from Batteries Not Included, their 2019 States robot, and the 2020 Rambots um, robot. And then we're going to take questions at the end. We'll probably have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Hold on. Excuse me. All right. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Micah. I'm the captain and design lead on 14943 Weber Rambots. Uh, we were the 2020 States Innovate Award winner, and I was also a Georgia Dean's List finalist last year. I'm Blake. Um, I was a member of Barry's Not Included for several years. I'm now an alumni and a current mentor. Um, Barry's Not Included was winning the Alliance um, 18, 19, 20 at Georgia State, and we also qualified for Worlds those years. And we were um, third seed Alliance captain at Worlds in 2019. All right, so to begin with um, kit, we're going to look at like, certain scenarios where you want to use kit and what it's useful for, um, and some of the pros and cons. So the advantage of kit, the first one is um, you have a much simpler design process. You don't have to go through the uh, custom design of custom parts because they're already designed for you. Um, and you don't have to go through the, the manufacturing of those parts either um, for the same reason. Um, also, kit has um, many applications in motion on robots. So you look at gears, you look at um, sprockets, motors, things of that nature. Um, most teams, even teams that go um, um, pretty deep down the rabbit hole of custom, still like to use, um, for the most part, kit motion um, parts. And depending on design goals or different mechanisms that you have, kit is often advantageous because of the reasons that I specified. Um, if, if you can complete certain goals that you outline with a kit part um, and, and you're happy with that, it's often advantageous to go that route because you save resources. Um, other applications include rapid prototyping. Um, it's used to make the mechanisms as proof of concepts because um, you can do it quickly and you can prove to yourself if that's something you want to pursue or if it's not. Um, for those teams who don't have access to advanced fabrication um, tools, this is often useful. Um, you know, fabrication tools, 3D printers, CNC routers, things of that nature are very expensive. Um, and kit often, oftentimes can get a lot of the same things done. Um, and so it's often advantageous to use for those teams who only have access to kit. Some common kit systems uh, that we look at mostly from order of most common to least common. Um, we have GoBuilda and Actobotics. Um, same company, um, similar parts. GoBuilda is where most of the focus and uh, innovation is right now. Um, you have Rev, which is um, very extrusion based, although they're branching out from that a little bit. Um, you see Tetrix a lot. Um, it's um, easier to get your hands on, a little bit cheaper. Um, but also doesn't have the same ceiling for um, the innovative parts that the other um, kit systems have. And when you look at VEX, VEX Pro, and Andymark, they're more of um, more niche companies for FTC because they don't make the same um, you know big kit parts that these other uh, systems make. Uh, however, they do have things that you look at Andymark for like compliant wheels, um, motors, VEX Pro, something similar. Well. So what's custom good for then? So if there isn't a kit counterpart uh, option for what you want to do, uh, then you're probably going to have to go down the custom route. So what Blake was saying earlier is that when you have something like a space constraint, a weight constraint, any type of level or complexity constraint, um, space, weight, whatever it may be, and you can do it with custom, then by all means, you should probably go down that route, that route unless you want to you know, just challenge yourself. 
Um, but when there are no kit counterparts, which will fit the weight, the size, whatever it may be, if you need to package it in a certain space, then you should probably look into a custom design. Um, when you're thinking about whether to go custom or kit, a question you should ask yourself is, could I make this part using kit? And how harshly uh, you want to answer this question is varying. It depends on your access to custom materials, access to machining, uh, your experience with CAD and things of that sort. Um, and it is up to personal preference and ease of access, like I said. Uh, some teams are, all, are always going to want to answer this question with a custom solution just because they have really easy access and they have really great uh, design skills. And some teams, when they don't have this much access or um, it's a lot easier for them to just get a kit part or they already have tons of kit parts, um, it'll be easier for them to just use a kit solution instead of a custom solution. You also have to ask yourself, what do I want this design to accomplish? So oftentimes a kit solution is going to be a lot easier to achieve, but it may not have the same level of um, you know, scoring potential that a custom solution may have. So you have to weigh your effort versus reward for going custom and kit. And this applies to more things than just manufacturing and robotics and FTC and FRC. Um, oftentimes the more complex solution is gonna take a lot more effort, but it'll raise your scoring capacity Whereas the simpler solution will be maybe more consistent um, and simpler to accomplish, but you'll score less. And obviously the most optimal solution is you have a complex system that works um, ex extremely consistently and it's complex enough to do the task at hand, but simple enough to, like I said, work consistently. Um, so sometimes kit or sometimes custom is better than kit despite more effort just because of the consistency option. Sorry, my uh, Google Slides is being weird. Um, and something that we should note is that most successful robots are almost entirely a mix of kit and custom. You're never going to see a robot that is 100% custom. Uh, you will see robots that are 100% kit. Uh, but when you look at the really high competitive teams like Gluten Free and uh, let's say Recharge Green, for example, which are two robots we'll take a look at, you'll see that they, ha they use both kit and custom parts uh, for various reasons that we talked about earlier in terms of complexity. They found a solution that worked better with kit, so they used it. Uh, they have easy access to kit. Um, and you know it's not worth manufacturing channels and different structural pieces and all the motion components um, and things of that sort. So one's not necessarily better than the other. You just have to uh, weigh when you want to use which one based off of the challenge, because uh, different challenges require different solutions, as I'm sure you guys know. So let's take a look at this robot. This is um, 11115 gluten-free. They're a Skystone robot. You can see it's very custom-based, but they do have kit components. So let's look at their list, lift system first. This is called the double reverse four bar system. Um, and this is made out of custom like aluminum box tube that they manufactured and cut themselves and bent. Um, they also have a custom intake. They have polycarbonate plates with uh, kit compliant wheels from Andy Mark between the plates. Um, and they also have a custom virtual four bar. So this is polycarbonate. All these pulleys are 3D printed. Um, the gripper is made out of CNC poly polycarbonate and 3D printed pieces. But you'll notice that gluten-free has an entirely actobotics-based kit drivetrain with Nexus mechanism wheels. Um, so for gluten-free, it wasn't worth the effort of trying to design um, and uphold a custom drivetrain when they could just use a very tried and true actobotics drivetrain design. Um, you also see that with the structure here. They have an actobotic C channel to hold up their double reverse four bar. So this is another team we're going to look at, um, 7236 Recharge Green, uh, another really competitive team um, in Skystone and really just historically. Um, this is their Skystone robot, of course. And to contrast with Gluten Free's robot, this robot is um, very kit based. Um, so you look at some of the main mechanisms on the robot, you see uh, the intake, they're using uh, VEX compliant wheels. Um, they're using lots of um, go build the parts in their intake. Um, you see um, go build the wheels, uh, mechanical wheels, go build a drivetrain, go build a structure everywhere. Um, they use Masubi slides for their um, vertical um, lift and rev slides for their um, horizontal 
um, extension. You see a couple custom parts here and there, just because um, there are only certain there there are certain applications of custom parts um, that are best for certain scenarios. You look at the phone holder, um, you look at the stone gripper, which was specific for that the, the stones and that challenge, um, and you, you look at some of the three D printed inserts um, between the Masumi slides. So very go build a kit based here. So when you're going through the design of a new mechanism, there are five steps that you should go through. And this is a process. It's like a um, recycling process. It's, you're never really done with it. You're only going to get to a solution that is uh, good enough. You're never going to get to a perfect solution, which is kind of something that you just have to learn to, to deal with because there's always going to be problems. You just have to figure out how to solve them. So the first thing is identify the problem. So for this uh, example, I'm going to go through Skystone. So we're going to look at the problem of getting a stone from the robot onto or on the from the field onto your robot. So that's the problem, right? We have to take a stone and manipulate it somehow. Next up will be to brainstorm solutions. So this is just, you know, you and your team, your design team come together and you just kind of spit out whatever comes to mind. So one option may be a claw, another option may be a wheeled intake, another option may be like a suction, whatever it may be, just anything that comes to your mind. These don't have to be optimal solutions and they, you probably won't find the optimal solution just, you know, spitting it out. Then once you've discussed these brainstorm solutions that your team members have, you should converge on a solution in CAD, which is computer aided design. So instead of if you have like access to a lot of kit parts, you can for sure do this in real life. You can make all these different solutions in real life and see which one works best. But oftentimes teams don't have tons and tons of parts at their disposal to just uh, make every every idea that they have. So the best option here is to converge on your solution in CAD, which means import the parts from the different uh, distributors or make your own custom parts and put them together in CAD and see which ones will work with your pre-existing robot and which ones will be uh, what you think will be the most efficient or most um, you know, highest scoring mechanism. After you've converged on a solution, you should go ahead and manufacture the solution in real life. So that means CNCing or laser cutting or 3D printing, whatever you need as well as uh, getting the kit parts that you need, putting it together, then you have to test it and there are going to be problems with it. Uh, the answer to this question is almost always yes. So then you need to go back to step one and identify what the problem is. So let's say we uh, decided to converge on the solution of a wheeled intake, like what you saw in a recharged and gluten freeze robot. Um, th let's say we did that and we found out that when we went to go pick up a stone, we could only pick them up in one orientation, right? If it was directly uh, straight on and you couldn't have any stones that were like perpendicular to the intake. Um, so you weren't able to pick up stones in all orientations, and that's a problem because you need to be able to do that if you want to be efficient. So we identified that problem. So a possible solution to that might have been um, introducing a springing system into your intake or more compliance into your intake system. So that way you can wrap around the stone in whatever um, way that the stone comes. Then you would converge on that solution in CAD, moving around whatever you needed, maybe spacing out the intake more. And then remanufacture it or buy the necessary parts that you need and again repeat. So there are a couple of design principles to keep in mind when you're going through the design process uh, and the design phase of the design process. Um, so and, and, and these three things are going to um, contribute to the success of designs you have on your robot. Um, so really important to keep in mind for these, and this these don't just apply to FTC. These are you often see these also emphasized uh, in professional industry. So um, first we have simplicity. Um, oftentimes a simple design is better design. Um, that's not always the case, um, but you want to make your design complex enough where it can complete the task, but um, make it as like. Um, make it as simple as possible where it can still complete the task, but um, you can ensure a more reliable design because simplicity will often um, coincide with reliability. Um, also, simplicity often means um, better manufacturability and lower costs and et cetera. Um, manufacturability is a really big one. Um, so when you, when you look at design, you're designing something in CAD, you can design anything you want to in CAD, absolutely, absolutely anything. Um, 
but that doesn't mean that you're always going to be able to manufacture that part that you uh, make in CAD. An example of this is um, say you want to design a side plate for your drivetrain of your robot, and you want to have a, a square that's recessed into the inside of the side plate to put a piece of extrusion into. Sure, you can make a square um, in your design in CAD, but if you want to, say, make that side plate out of aluminum and put it on a CNC router, your CNC router uses a circular drill bit, um, and it's not going to be able to make those perfect 90 degree um, edges in that um, side plate. So you're going to have to come up with another solution because you're not going to get your um, intended result. So, you know, a different solution might be having a circle um, that is the, um, has the same diameter as the distance between the two corners of your extrusion. Um, that way your extrusion will still fit in and you'll be able to manufacture it. Um, and you also see this with um, certain things like screw holes. You want to make sure um, you have a small enough drill bit on your CNC router or whatever you're using um, to make those drill holes the size that you want them, or screw holes um, the size that you want them to be. Um, same thing goes with other things like 3D printers. You want to make sure that whatever you're 3D printing is going to come out the way you want it. Um, you don't want, you don't want to have massive overhangs. You want things supported for the most part um, so that you get your desired result. You also look at material selection. Um, you know, oftentimes per design, you want to go for something strong, something lightweight. Um, maybe you settle on carbon fiber. You don't see carbon fiber very often in FTC um, because of some of these issues that we're going to discuss. But um, that might satisfy strength and uh, lightweightness that you're looking for. However, carbon fiber is very difficult to work with. And, um, and unless you know what you're doing, um, just throwing it on a CNC router and machining it the same way you would aluminum, you're not going to have the same results. Um, so it's very important to look at manufacturability of parts and materials um, when you're implementing those designs. Uh, with serviceability, another important one, um, once you have a part designed and manufactured and it's um, on your robot, serviceability is a question of, are you going to be able to uh, get to that part and service it if it needs servicing? So um, this is important, especially on integral parts of mechanisms, because oftentimes when you implement a first design um, or even um, a later design, you're going to have unforeseen um, items that are going to wear down, or you may even have intentional consumable items on your robot. And if it takes um, a crazy amount of time to get to that uh, item and replace it um, or work on it and access it, um, that's something that you don't want to happen. So you want to design your parts in a way that they're going to be accessible and easy to work on. Um, an example of this um, might be, um, you know, you have um, something that breaks on your robot. Um, I know we've had issues before where we have parts that might disconnect from um, like a piece of extrusion um, and the nuts on that extrusion that slide in the extrusion are very hard to access. Uh, there's there have been some recent design um, designs from GoBuilder that have come out to resolve this issue, but you have to take apart a big chunk of your robot to get those nuts out and move them where you want them to go. So that can be tricky sometimes. Designing around that is important. Um, next slide. So yeah, I just want to add a couple of things. Just give examples of of three of these things. So for the simplicity point. Um, a simpler design is a better design. So if we look at those two robots that we saw earlier, gluten-free has a double reverse four bar, which is a pretty complex design, and recharged has a just a you know linear slide system that goes up and down. Um, a simpler design in this case for 99% of teams is going to be the slide system, and that will work so much more reliably than a double reverse four bar will for 99% of teams. Again, we're talking about gluten-free and recharge. These are, you know, the top two teams in the world. But in this case, I would highly advise you to try to execute the slide-based design rather than the double reverse four bar design just because of consistency and complexity of the design. On the other hand, um, when we're looking at the problem of taking a stone off of the field and into the robot, the simplest design would probably, would probably be a claw or something. Um, I would recommend a more complex design of the wheeled intake over a claw, even though it is more complex because it'll be more consistent. So I'd say probably err on the side of consistency while also being able to 
score uh, as much as you can. Uh, more complex often does not equal more points. Um, manufacturability is, uh, Blake covered this very well, um, in terms of if you're going to be able to make it. For example, if you have a ginormous 3D printed part that you want to print, I know we had this crazy uh, motor mount and slide mount that we had last year that we wanted to 3D print, and this thing was like, I don't know, maybe 10 inches tall or something like that, and uh, very bulky. And it just was impossible to 3D print well and get it working. Um, and then we realized that if we separate this into smaller parts and CNC some and 3D print others, it'll be a lot better. And serviceability, our robot last year, you know, um, it had a bunch of flaws in terms of serviceability because we had an entire plate where every mechanism was connected to it. So if we wanted to take one thing apart, we had to take apart basically the entire robot. Um, and I'd say if you can learn from that mistake and do not uh, make everything connected to one central piece, be able to access something if it breaks. All right, so another important thing to keep in mind when you're designing is cost of parts that you're designing. So um, things that cost more are often better when you look at um, scoring potential um, and oftentimes um, more complex design that are going to be able to achieve more. And sometimes it even, it even costs more to improve manufacturability and serviceability. So there's certainly a balance here, but you also want to weigh you know, obviously teams only have so much funding every year. Um, and a lot of that funding goes to um, signing up for competitions and you only have so much left over um, for the parts that you're putting on your robot. Um, and some teams are even looking at taking chunks of that money and, you know, um, spending it on getting some of this custom manufacturing equipment like 3D printers, CNC routers, laser cutters, things of that nature. Um, so this is important to keep in mind. Um, if we want to, if we want to use like a, the carbon fiber example again, um, sure, it's strong, it's lightweight, it's hard to work with. Let's say you're able to work with it. Um, you know, the cost of carbon fiber is is crazy high compared to um, something like aluminum or uh, Delrin or things of that nature. Um, so that's that's important to keep in mind when you're designing your robot. You don't want to run out of money. Um, strength and weight they kind of go hand in hand. Um, regardless of whether there's a maximum weight rule, um, which there isn't this year, but there has been in past years, um, weight reduction is always important because it's always going to benefit robot performance. Um, whether it's just overall weight, that's going to um, enhance acceleration of your drivetrain, or it is um, weight at certain parts of mechanisms. For example, if you have a linear slide system that is moving vertically, um, you don't want to. You want to make sure it's going to be as lightweight as possible, because you want it to move as quickly as possible. More weight on the end of it is going to cause reliability issues as well as slow it down. Um, so weight's important to keep in mind. Um, however, you don't want to sacrifice um, strength when you're trying to lose weight on your robot. Um, these things sometimes go hand in hand. Sometimes they don't. Um, but you don't want to make your robot so light that. You, you also want to have a strength component because strength is what's going to ensure that you have a reliable robot um, and it's going to ensure that you have predictable performance of your robot. Um, you don't want any you know, unwanted compliance on any of your mechanisms um, that could result in um, unforeseen uh, incidents on the field when you're playing with other robots. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the most important, reliability is something you always want to um, keep in mind. Um, and it should be a top priority for all FTC teams. Um, it doesn't matter how good your robot is, uh, how high the scoring ceiling of your robot is, if it doesn't run reliably, so it only runs half the matches. Well, I'd rather have, um, you know, a, a fully reliable robot that has a more moderate scoring ceiling, um, so you're going to have better luck with it. So prioritize making sure your mechanisms on your robot are reliable, especially before competitions, um, and prioritize that over you know, throwing on new um, kind of willy-nilly designs uh, and, and mechanisms onto your robot um, because you want to make sure that everything you put on your robot is going to work as you intend it to work. All right, so um, getting into some of the CAD software, the computer-aided design software, 
that's going to enable you to make any custom parts. Um, first of all, you have to have CAD software if you want to get into the custom world. It's the only way to design, uh, you know, 3D parts um, on your computer so that you can uh, manufacture them and then um, use them on your robot. So there are several different options for this. I've, I've listed um, a couple of them. Some of the most common are the ones at the top. You have SolidWorks, um, Onshape, which has um, web-based, um, and so you can collaborate easier. Um, and Fusion 360 um, is also used. PTC Creo is another one. Um, you don't see it as often. Um, I would recommend looking into the top three. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you look into. If you have experience with one of them, stick with that one um, because that's going to enable you to start designing parts quicker. Um, you don't, they're, they're all a little different, but for the most part, the same, but you still don't want to spend time relearning any CAD software. Um, but I'll also say that because they're, you know, once you learn to design 3D parts in CAD, um, switching between softwares uh, be becomes not all that big of a deal because it's the same concept. Um, when you're going through design in a 3D design software. Um, I'll also say, if you're picking one of these three, um, look at which can be run on Windows or Mac OS, depending on what you have access to. Um, I know Fusion 360 can be run on Mac OS. The other two, well, Onshape is web-based, it doesn't matter. SOLIDWORKS is only Windows. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Um, and then once you pick one, it's important to stick with it and go and learn it. There's lots of information out there uh, for tut tutorials. Lots of people have helpful information um, for you to um, kind of aid you in that process of learning. All right, so um, for specific use of CAD, um, you're gonna want to use CAD software to design um, these parts and you're gonna to wanna to imp implement them along with other parts that you're designing into robot assemblies and mechanism sub-assemblies. So while it's not um, super important and it's not necessary to design your entire robot in CAD, um, it's very good idea to um, you know, have different designs, different mechanisms, different parts of mechanisms in assemblies with each other so that you can ensure that all of these designs are going to work together well um, they're going to fit within physical constraints. Um, the interactions are what you're expecting them to be and what you desire them to be. Um, I will say that um, having full robot CAD is very nice. Um, and even just, um, you know, CAD for mechanisms and stuff, um, it's going to make your life easier for when you go to assemble that part. Um, it's great for judging to be able to show off your robot designs easily because um, you, you can have something physical that you can reference easily. Um, and once you have full CAD models, you can do some pretty powerful things by looking at um, kinematics of moving parts on your robot. You can oftentimes predict the weight of your robot, and you can do some cool stuff with FEA, which is fundamental element analysis. Um, and that enables you to look at um, uh, strengths and stress of parts, how much it'll deform, um, and, and um, given certain forces. So one thing to add on to what was what Blake was saying, one thing that's really cool that you can do with CAD is we were talking about the strength to weight ratio and finding a balance between those things earlier. One way to reduce weight on your mechanisms and on your custom parts is called pocketing, which is basically just taking out certain parts of your plates where you don't need that weight for the structural integrity, as it meaning you could take out material and it wouldn't uh, significantly affect the structural integrity. And you can do analysis on that in CAD. So if you take a, a pocketed part, you can apply certain forces um, to different places and you can see how it's likely to deform. And then you can adjust your model from there um, and get as much rate, weight reduction as you can while maintaining structural integrity. Yeah, absolutely. So um, next. Oh, oh, sorry, you go ahead. So next I want to talk about uh, machinery and fabrication. So the different techniques that you can use to go about making custom parts. So we have some common fabrication techniques, including CNC, which is computer numerically controlled 
uh, routers, mills, and lathes. I'd say CNC routers are by far the most common. Uh, CNC routers and 3D printing are the most common fabrication techniques used in FTC. If you have access to CNC mills and CNC lathes, uh, happy for you. Um, you can use those as well to make different types of designs. Um, but a CNC router is used to create 3D and 2D designs. And what I mean by 3D and 2D is if you have like a piece of paper, for example, you could take um, a pair of scissors and cut out something and that would be a 2D design. Um, a 3D design is if you had, let's say, a piece of Play-Doh or a piece of clay and you sculpted it into something um, and uh, you had your design based off of that. So that would be a, is what I classify as a 3D design. Um, and an example of a, C, a robot that used a lot of CNC routed uh, aluminum parts is the batteries not included robot. Uh, they have one eighth inch thick aluminum CNC routed parts. Um, and the way that a CNC router works is by taking basically, uh, it looks like a, dr a drill bit, it's called an end mill, uh, and it spins at really, really high RPMs. Um, and it traces the outline of the shape um, and it can also move in the X, Y, and Z axis in order to create both 2D and 3D parts and it'll cut through the material uh, and then you have your part. Next is laser cutting, which is creating 2D designs. So you can basically, while the laser can move in the Z axis, it doesn't move in the Z axis while you're actually cutting something. Um, so it's basically you're able to cut things out, like I said, on a piece of paper. Um, except you can do that, you know, with plastics and other materials I'll get into later. Um, an example of this is our robot, Rambot's robot from 2020. We uh, used a laser cutter to cut uh, 3 16 inch Delrin plastic uh, on a laser cutter. And the next most common fabrication technique is 3D printing. I'd say uh, if you took a survey of most uh, FTC teams that that said they had custom parts, they would probably all have some 3D printing on their robot. Uh, 3D printing can be used to create what I would classify as 2D designs, but that's pretty inefficient for 2D designs. I would recommend using it for 3D designs and these other two techniques for 2D. Um, and the way that a 3D printer works is it can move in the X, Y, and Z axes. And um, you basically supply it with a string of plastic and the uh, extruder, which is the part that basically spits out plastic, heats up the plastic really hot, melts it, and then extrudes it as it's moving around 3D space to create uh, your design. Both the batteries not included and Rambot's robot use significant numbers of 3D printed parts. Less common fabrication techniques, but these are still viable. I would just say less common because they're harder to get access to is a water jet. A uh, water jet works very similarly to how a laser cutter works, except instead of shining a powerful laser through the material, it uh, mixes water in an abrasive, which is usually sand, uh, and it shoots a very high powered stream of water through the material and cuts it. Uh, and it's used to create 2D designs. An example is the Circuit Runners Black Robot used a lot of water jetted uh, aluminum. And you can actually go to uh, Kennesaw State University, KSU, here in Georgia. They have a water jet, and they will water jet your designs for free. And they will also supply you with free material, free aluminum to do so. So if you don't have access to custom parts, but you want to get a custom port, part or start experimenting with it, I would highly recommend contacting a guy named Ed Barker at KSU, and he will be happy to help you out. We've also got plasma cutting, which is basically the equivalent of laser cutting, except it's all often used for um, metals like steel and aluminum, and it can cut metals. Uh, and it shines, instead of a laser, it shines plasma through the materials. This is used for 2D designs. The welding is another one that's pretty not common, but if you have access to uh, welding machine and you know how to weld, this could be really cool. You can create 3D designs with this. Um, basically, a welder is the big boy version of a soldering iron, I would classify. So um, you take a string of metal and you melt it down and you can uh, affix parts to one another. So let's say you had two CNC plates that you wanted to affix in an L shape like that at a 90 degree angle, you could weld them together uh, and they would be, you know, they won't come apart. So these are hey, pictures. Mike, yep. can I can jump in real quick? Sure. Um, can you go back to the last slide real quick? Yeah. Um, while we were talking about that, I wanted to um, let everyone know, um, Brent from Checkmate Robotics, um, I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll put it in chat if you guys cannot. 
Um, but he said that um, their team is planning on um, providing 3D printing, uh, printing services for teams without 3D printer access. Um, and he included an email that you guys can reach him at um, to talk to him about this. So I'll post that in chat in a second. Thank you. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. I should also mention the Rambots lab. Um, in terms of uh, machining, we have a laser cutter, um, a CNC router, but it cannot do metal and a bunch of 3D printers, and that is open to the community. Um, now that uh, COVID-19 is a thing, I'm not sure about people actually coming into the lab and using it. We'll have to contact our mentors about that. But if you have a design that you want or a model that you want 3D printed, that you want laser cut, um, we will be happy to make that for you. We're in Sandy Springs and all. Anyone that's interested in that, I'll uh, mention my email at the end and uh, you can contact me about that and we'll get you set up. Um, so these are some pictures of the machines that I mentioned before. This is a CNC router. You can see it has the uh, two ax three axes, excuse me. Um, this is the router. This is the part that spins the end mill, end mill really fast. Um, this is the laser cutter. You see it looks kind of like a miniature version of the CNC router. Uh, this part here, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but this black part on the silver um, rail is the laser. Um, something that I didn't mention are hand tools and non-CNC tools like a table saw and a drill press. These are also great for making you know, semi-custom parts if you want to either modify your custom parts or try to make something uh, by hand. A drill press is uh, just basically you know, a, a handheld drill, except it's uh, probably more accurate because uh, you have a spring-loaded actuator here that can drill directly downwards. Same goes with a table saw. Um, it's basically just a blade you know, that spins really fast and you can cut uh, wood with it. I'm sure there, you can get blades to cut thin metals with it as well. Uh, and then a 3D printer, these are uh, smaller than these other machines, uh, but you've got the extruder here, the filament, the roll of plastic going into the extruder, uh, and it can move in these three axes. Um, yeah, and typically um, you're going to make smaller designs on a 3D printer than you will on a laser cutter or CNC router. And then finally, we've got a water jet, um, which is, uh, looks really similar to a CNC router, works like a laser cutter. Um, the size, the scale here probably isn't very representative, but these things are usually pretty big. Um, and uh, like I said before, it shoots water and sand or a different abrasive into the material in order to cut it. And I'd say the machining times on a CNC router and laser cutter are pretty equivalent. It depends on the complexity of the design. While a water jet is going to take a little bit longer, but it's similar. And a 3D printer that can take from as quickly, you know, as like maybe half an hour all the way up to 24 hours or even longer, depending on how complex the part is. So uh, when you're machining, you have to pick a material that you want to make your custom parts out of. Some commonly used materials are aluminum. And in order of increasing strength, you have aluminum 5052, which is what KSU will give you for free if you choose to use their water jet. Um, 6061 and 7075. So these are just different uh, strengths of aluminum that are good for you know different strength applications. Um, whereas you might have a low load versus a high load, that type of deal. Plastics like Delrin, uh, which is laser safe, which is what we use in our laser cutter. Uh, HDPE, which is high density polyethylene, polycarbonate and acrylic. Um, some notes about these materials, high density polyethylene will burn in a laser cutter. It is not laser safe. Polycarbonate is also not laser safe. Um, it will release uh, particles and fumes that can be toxic. Um, and acrylic is really shatter is prone to shatter. Um, so I would I wouldn't use acrylic for anything that's load bearing, only for um, you know aesthetic purposes. HDPE and polycarbonate or PC are very common choices for plastics that you can CNC. I would highly recommend looking into these if you have a CNC router. Um, of course, uh, you can also use different uh, types of plywood if you don't have access or can't get your hands on plastics or aluminum. 3D printing plastics like PLA, PETG, and ABS are the three most common um, plastics used for FTC 3D printing. PLA and ABS have similar properties, and PETG or PETG is going to be a little bit stronger, but um, you can probably interchange these on your robot and it, uh, on your robot and on your custom pieces, and it won't make much of a difference. 
Um, and you can all use these with like a similar 3D printer. You just have to adjust the settings slightly. Less common materials, but still viable if you can get your hands on them are carbon fiber, which we talked about earlier. This is notorious for being super lightweight while being really while having strengths similar to that of aluminum. Uh, so you kind of get the best of both worlds, but you have to be uh, very careful when you're machining it on a lathe or a CNC rod or whatever it may be, because it releases uh, particles that if you ingest them can be very uh, harmful. Um, and also plastics like ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, um, similar to HDPE, um, just a little bit, you know, I guess more exclusive. It's also, I don't think you can laser it. I might be wrong about that, but you can look up what is laser safe, what isn't laser safe and et cetera. Um, one big, uh, thing I would say is whenever you're going to use any sort of machinery, make sure you take all the safety precautions, make sure you're with an adult or someone is, you know, a trusted mentor is, um, watching what you do and is knowledgeable about how to use these machines and you know be aware of your material choices uh, because things that you might not know are dangerous are very dangerous and you should do the research beforehand in terms of how you can machine what you have access to uh, or vice versa like you're muted Thank you. Um, we just do a bit of a wide scope case study on the 2019 um, Georgia State um, competition BNI robot and the 2020 um, Rambots robot for Skystone, um, and just and just show how kind of what we talk about went into the design of these robots. So um, this this these pictures are from uh, BNI's Georgia State robot. Um, we had a custom mechanum drivetrain um, with um, CNC routed um, eighth inch thick aluminum side plates that you can see there. Um, this was our first time implementing a custom drivetrain, so um, as, as well as using a CNC router. So it was a bit of an experiment for us. Ended up working out. Um, we used a our, um, our horizontal linear slides, which are the channel that you can see on the outside of the robot, right above the side plates. Uh, those were kit parts that we, um, from Actobotics that we kind of intermixed. Um, they use um, the linear bearings from Actobotics that they offered. Um, and those are stainless steel um, 12 mil diameter rods, um, very heavy. Um, I wouldn't use it again, but that's what we used. Um, our intake um, had an, an actuating joint that allowed it to flip up and down um, using a worm gear. Um, and we used a custom surgical tube intake um, and a custom housing as well. So our housing, um, you can't see it real well. Um, I'd say the best picture would be uh, the top picture. You can kind of see behind the black uh, sprocket is a big black intake um, housing, and that was all 3D printed. That was like a, a four day print, so it was pretty massive. Um, and then we had our custom surgical tubing intake. Um, we then had a 3D printed um, ramp that allowed the minerals to uh, travel between the intake and the deposit. And we used for our deposit, we used a um, Actobotics uh, vertical linear slide. We use their um, mini V wheel kit. Um, there, there are better options than that. Um, but if you're going for something simple and easy to um, implement into your design, we were already using a lot of Actobotics. That was a good choice. So you know, a case of simplicity over complexity. Even though simplicity um, meant that it wasn't quite as um, efficient as something a little bit more custom. You look at something like a Masumi slide, um, but that's of, co of course you have to have some custom stuff with that. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to implement. Um, and then our big red uh, deposit housing, which you can see best in the bottom right, um, is all 3D printed. Again, another big print. Um, something you have to worry about, it depends on the printer, but when you start getting big prints like that, you have to worry about one, fitting on the print bed, but also, you want to make sure that um, you don't have any unforeseen warping of prints that can start to happen when you have big surface area on your print bed. So you want to, you want to be careful of that. Um, oftentimes it's important to um, or wise to print um, certain things in parts. 
So this housing was actually printed in two parts. Um, and you can see there's some uh, epoxy that we use to um, connect the two. So, um, and then finally we used for our um, lifting mechanism, we used um, some more um, linear bearings from Actobotics, um, a worm gear and um, a big steel hook. Um, and then lastly, the thing I'll say is we, there was some custom um, most motion solutions that we had. Um, and this is pretty common in a lot of robots. You look at certain things like uh, pulleys um, used for linear motion mechanisms. So on the bottom left picture is a really good image of the, the rigging and the spool for our um, vertical lift system. That's all 3D printed, that black spool that you see there. Um, and so, and we, and we use more 3D printed pulleys um, all where, everywhere on a robot for um, linear mechanisms. So that's very helpful, um, relatively simple to design, relatively simple to create and implement on the robot. And it allows you some much needed flexibility for those types of parts. Um, and then of course, um, wiring is something that's often not um, emphasize enough when you're designing a robot. And um, oftentimes it's better to um, spend a lot of time uh, routing wires in your robot. I remember um, each time we, or at least for this robot, that we it took several days, probably a total of, you know, six, eight hours to wire this robot. Um, and it's, it's oftentimes wise, depending on um, how much money you have, because it's not exactly um, very, um, co um, Cost-effective. Cost-effective and it's not easily reused is to cut connectors and do a lot of soldering of wires yourself. There's some um, rules you have to be um, aware of um, you need to make sure you're using correct gauge wires and things of that nature. But um, oftentimes having custom length wires is um, helpful. It keeps things neat. Um, and um, you, you don't want big, you know, wads of wires that are going to your robot, so that's important. Um, all the kit that we used on this robot was Actobotics. Um, and we made use of CNC router and 3D printing um, a lot on this robot. I'm gonna go through this a little uh, kind of quickly just so we have time for questions, but uh, this is our 2020 States robot also. Um, so as you can see, these are full CAD um, pictures that we had. We had the entire robot in CAD just because so much of it was custom that we couldn't afford to design just one part at a time and hope that it fit. We had to make sure everything uh, fit before we decided to make everything. Um, we have a custom uh, mechanism or mechanism drivetrain uh, where we use kit go build a wheels, as you can see, um, and kit motion, never rest motors, and uh, go build a sprockets and chain. Uh, but the side plates and the structure are mostly custom, uh, laser cut Delrin. Um, and we have a compliant wheel intake for the stones, which was made out of Delrin um, plates and 3D printed mounting structure. Um, we also did uh, a lot of 3D printed pulleys, which is a great application of 3D printers, is, is uh, printing custom pulleys uh, and sprockets sometimes. Um, and for our vertical slides to be able to stack the stones, we used the Misumi SAR slides um, and with custom 3D printed inserts for the V bearings to be able to wrap the string. Um, and then we also had a virtual four bar, which was mostly uh, kit stuff. We just had um, custom arms for the virtual four bar and uh, custom like housing and, and gripper attachment for the servo. Um, everything was made in Fusion 360, and it was laser cut out of Delrin, uh, black Delrin, 3 sixteenths of an inch, and uh, 3D prints were made from blue PETG. Um, and in terms of custom wiring, we did have one thing that we did, which was really helpful, was we made custom coiled cable for our servos on our lift. So that way, when we went up, the cables would extend. When we went down, uh, they wouldn't be everywhere, and they were able to be packaged nicely into the robot. Uh, so coiled cables are a really great example of custom wiring that you can implement. Uh, and those actually can be reused, although the lengths may differ from year to year. Um, uh, if you're having trouble thinking about extending mechanisms, I would look into custom 
coiled cable uh, wires for servos and for motors. Just be careful of the gauges. Like Blake said, there are certain rules about that. Um, one last thing I want to say is if you have any questions that you want to ask me, Blake, or anyone else um, that we have in the FTC Georgia community, you can join the unofficial Discord server. Um, if you look at this QR code, you'll be sent an invite link, or you can go to tinyurl.com slash GIFTC Discord. Um, we got a lot of teams in there with a lot of experience, a lot of veteran teams. Um, so whenever you have a question, that's a really good place to go to to get answers and to get help and feedback on designs and uh, just generally hang out and chat. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys for listening. Um, now we can take some questions if anyone has any. Yeah, that was an awesome presentation. Thank, uh, you. thank you guys for all the effort you have put in. Uh, our first question isn't really a question, but an advertisement. So 12961 is going to provide 3D printing services for teams without 3D printer access. So if you're interested in that, be sure to contact Checkmate Robotics at gmail.com. Yeah, thank you, Checkmate. That's, uh, that's really great. Thank you. Uh, 3D printing, like we mentioned, is a great way to get started with custom. Oh, also, I said I was going to mention this. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, if you want to look into getting something laser cut or also 3D printed, uh, or if you have wood that you want to CNC router, or if you want actually a banner too, we have a vinyl cutter and vinyl printer, um, contact me, mreach at weberschool.org. Um, and uh, I, we, I can try to get you set up with that and get you your parts. Yep, um, we still have around six minutes for questions. So if anyone has like thinks of anything, feel free to type it into the Q&A. Um, I guess we can start with, what CAD softwares do you guys think is the easiest to learn with? Um, I can start. I, so I learned uh, Fusion 360 as my first CAD software. Um, that was just kind of a chance thing. My school teaches a 3D modeling class and the instructor uses Fusion 360. So that's what I was taught. Um, but I would say Onshape is another really good one. If you don't have a wonderful computer, like I don't have a you know, super powerful computer, um, Onshape is web-based and uh, is a lot lower powered. So you can do a lot of stuff with Onshape. I know tons of teams who use Onshape and I've found great success with that. Um, so I'd probably recommend Fusion 360 or Onshape. If you want to get really simple, Tinkercad, I guess I would say is an option. Uh, I know Blake used Tinkercad a uh, while <laughs> back, while back on batteries not included when he was 3D printing some stuff. Uh, if you find a design on, let's say, like Thingiverse or something, and you want to tweak it a little bit, you can take it into Tinkercad if you really want to be lower level about it. Um, but I'd say if you want to get into custom and just, you know, CAD in general, Fusion 360 and Onshape are great places to start. Yeah, um, I'll com comment on that real quick. Um, I, I will say... Blake's going to have a dissenting opinion. <laughs> There's kind of like a war theory going on. There, there, there's a lot of people that think a lot of different things in the CAD community, um, of, of you know about what's best. And I think you, you see how many different people have so many different opinions. And I think you can chalk that up to that, you know, all these CAD softwares are going to be very similar in terms of capability. Um, I, I will say, I mean, I, I have m most of my experience with SolidWorks. Um, but I've also used Fusion 360. Um, I'm a big fan of SolidWorks. Um, it's, it's, you see it a lot used in the professional industry. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, but, you know, um, you definitely need a capable computer to run it. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about CAD software though, just pick one. Yeah, pick one and learn it is basically the gist. If you are looking into going to, into design as a profession, SolidWorks is a great option because that's almost always what's used in industry. Thanks, guys. Um, you have a comment saying jfirst.org slash manufacturing is where you'll go to get info for water jet stuff. And then our next question is, in your experience, are there any significant differences between Inventor and Fusion 360? 
Mm, no. <laughs> one runs on Windows and one runs on Windows and Mac is, I would say, basically what the differences are. Um, they have a very similar layout in terms of like the graphical interface. Uh, Fusion, I will say, gives you the ability, if you're a student, to do uh, cloud rendering. So a rendering is like, here, if I um, go back a second. I'm not sure I have any grid. These aren't renders. These are just pictures of my robot. Um, but you can create basically photorealistic renders of your robot in CAD with Fusion 360's cloud rendering program. Um, it's built into Fusion 360. And you can get free credits as a student. So that basically means they'll put your uh, all the intense processing that you need to do. They'll send it out to a cloud-based computing system somewhere. Uh, it'll do the rendering for you and then give you your images back to you. And you can use that in your engineering notebook as a great way to show off your robot and CAD. Um, I'm not sure. I think Rough Inventor does have rendering, but it doesn't ha give you access to cloud-based rendering. Um, I might be wrong about that. But I would say anything by Autodesk, you know, Fusion, Inventor, they're both good. Yeah, Fusion is definitely great for rendering. I mean, if you're looking at doing some rendering, I would definitely recommend using Fusion for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. So do you have any suggestions for how people who have that experience with building can learn about like the design principles that you mentioned or just like how to design things in general? Blake, you want to take that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I would say that I would start by reading through, um, you know, FTC forums, uh, watching videos of successful robots. Um, you just want to kind of open your eyes and and put yourself in the middle of all of these um, well-designed robots, well-designed mechanisms, and that will enable you to familiarize yourself with, you know, what kind of mechanisms are going to be best for accomplishing different things. Um, and, and and when you when you settle on certain mechanisms, there are often a lot of tutorials out there that teach you how to implement something like that, how to build something like that, how to design something like that. Um, and you can all always um, you know ask some experienced people. Um, you know, FTC Discord for Georgia. Um, it's a great place to start. Uh, DM someone, uh, ask questions. A lot of knowledgeable people out there that can help you with this. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, highly agree. There's also a thing called Game Manual Zero, which is a like play on Game Manual One and Two, which was created by the FTC community by like I don't know, probably upwards of 200 teams have contributed to it. So if you look up Game Manual Zero FTC on Google, you'll get a link to it. That has tons of resources about not only building but also programming, outreach, business, everything that you would want to know about FTC is on that. Um, that has some really good guides about how to choose like drive trains, how to choose mechanisms and things like that. And I know it's really daunting when you look at robots like gluten freeze um, and they, you see all this custom stuff and you're like, how did they do that? It, you got to start small and you got to start just by tinkering. So, you know, learn a CAD program, start making some custom parts, maybe some 3D printed stuff and work your way up. You don't have to go super big instantly. That is really difficult to do and will probably be counterproductive to your progress. So just start small, is what I would say. Yeah. Definitely. Game Manual Zero is such a great resource. There's so much information on there, so it can be a little overwhelming. Um, but it was created for people uh, who are newer to FTC to learn this information. Just uh, so many experienced, successful people and successful teams have contributed to that uh, resource. So definitely, um, I would use that. All right. Thank you for answering the Q&A questions. Um, so again thank you for all of the effort you uh blake and micah have put into this presentation it's really awesome um we have one last minute so thank you everyone for attending reminder that all sessions will be posted on gafirst.org at the conclusion of our symposium uh i believe that the uh this is the last session for today so tomorrow at 10 a.m will be the first will be the beginning of the symposium. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for attending and you're all free to leave. Hope this was really helpful and see y'all tomorrow. See you guys, thank you for coming. Yep, see you guys, thanks. I got a